See if I can do this without smoke. I got into this divided medium mating nuke a couple days ago and both sides have queens, but this, uh, I don't know, the side nearest to me has only got a handful of bees. Not even a handful, like maybe a cup full or less. And it's just not going to be a viable unit. But they had a mated queen in here. I was kind of shocked. And she's laying. But there's no way that they're viable. So I was thinking, well, how can I boost them? You know, what can I do? And then I found a hive today that is queenless. So I'm going to drop her into there and that will solve my problem. These bees are working a little bit of basswood. That's a mix, but it's got basswood in it. It's Saturday. My wife took the kids to see a movie and she told me I could work all day. So I got up at five and was gone from the house by 10 after. Went and moved some nukes and I've been on the go ever since. It's quarter after four right now. So I'm coming out to my home yard and I'm just planning on doing some light work. I need to queen check that nuke, queen check that nuke, that nuke, that nuke, that nuke, those three, two, that's two. There's two in there, two there, two there, two there. And then I've moved three nukes in over there that probably need a box. And some of these may need a box. I think that was a swarm, maybe. I don't know. Well, that's a good, honest 13 hour day. I think I'm going to go home and cool off. I've got to move five or six more nukes in the morning. I've got them up on top of double screen boards on some larger nukes or colonies and they're just getting in the way so I need to move them and one of the draw well it's a benefit and a drawback <laughs> depending on how you look at it of this time of year is it gets daybreak about 5 a.m. so there's no sleeping in in the morning if I'm moving bees I've got to get up and and add them there's a painted turtle or a mud turtle crossing the road here. <laughs> I think that's either a painted turtle. I think the three most common that look like that are a map turtle, a painted turtle, or red-eared slider and I'm not sure which that is I'm not a I'm not an expert on those I'm guessing it's a painted turtle but it could be a map turtle too no idea So I've run out of boxes of foundation. You can see I've got a bunch of frames here. I've got foundation stacked there, but I have not married the two because of dirt daubers. It is difficult to store boxes with foundation tight enough that the dirt daubers won't move, won't move into them. And once they build on that foundation, it leaves mud and it's really hard to get off. Um, even hot water and a scrub brush won't get all of it off.
feel a lot better now. We got 50 some odd put together, ready to go. I think that's enough to get me through the weekend. Been up since 3.30, it's now 8.13, and I am almost at Corey Stevens' place, the Queen Wizard of Missouri. It's gonna be a long day. I don't, I hope that the video, I just hope I do the video justice. I really do. Uh, this is kind of a big deal. It could be a really big deal for hygienic testing, for testing for mite resistance in honeybees. Um, it's got that potential, it really does. And I hope I am able to show it and explain it and bring a little light to it. Because it could actually matter, it really could. <laughs> so I'm here with Corey Stevens. Corey, what's the word of the day? Well, we're doing some UBO testing here with Dr. Kara. And so now you're far. throwing a lot of acronyms out. Yep, yep. What What does this mean? Well, maybe it'd be best if Kara explained here. We're basically using unhealthy brood odor, pheromones, spraying it on the brood. We're giving them two hours and we're measuring their hygienic response, basically, or an uncapping response. Would you change the verbiage on that, any? You got it. Okay. I think you nailed it, yeah. So what's the point of all this? We're looking for mite resistance, and it also gives, seems to give viral or brood disease resistance as well, so huge win. What is the significance? Well, we're, we're a breeder, so we are, have been obsessed with mite and disease resistance for quite some time. There's been some methods you helped, like with the Harbo assay, that are that will give you some clues of whether your hive's resistant or not. I think this is gonna be a game changer, really. It's so much faster, like, we tested just a couple of us, what all of us did with Harbo's this last time. Yeah. And we're at it again, and we'll do even more today, so. So there were, like, five of us here when we did the Harbo assays, exactly. and we and tested 30. 30 right. colonies yep and we did 30 and that took hours of us. it yeah. took hours for five of us yeah plus frame retrieval and everything too yep. so uh, yesterday we knocked out 30 with yep with just three a few of us, of us. yep in about four hours mm -hmm. that's frame pulling and everything testing and data collection yep so it's faster it's going to be superior i think awesome We're excited about it i'm super glad she's here to show us what's up this is the this is the queen here she's she came up with it this is her technology and her research so we're honored to be able to test it on our bees it's fun stuff great to work with a bsh breeder too <laughs> I think that's the yeah. There's yeah, a line. That's the indentation. Yep. Yeah. So they started Pretty removing good. some of those. It looks like. Yeah. Beautiful. I'd breed from that one. It's one thirty. I just finished up at Corey's. I think I got a lot of really good stuff man i mean really really good um 
quick notes, it seems like there is a strong correlation between harboassay results and the UBO results because um, Kara Wagner said that she had not tested at an apiary that had as many high scorers as Corey's. So Corey had a lot of high scores, which would be over 60% of the caps removed uh, within two hours. And then the ones that weren't high scorers, he had a large per large percentage that were medium scorers. And then, you know, not that many that were low scorers, but there were some. So I was able to get footage of all three. Um, it, it's, I don't think it's gonna be a perfect correlation. Like, it's super interesting, but uncap recap behavior where the bees sense there's something going on in that cell and they open it up to investigate and then maybe they say okay this this brood's fine and they'll recap that cell that is a common thing to see in resistant colonies so you would think well that is correlated to harboassay and it's correlated to UBO since those two are correlated. Of course, we don't have research on any of this. We don't have firm numbers on any of it. This is all just speculation. But we saw some colonies today that had a lot, a high expression of uncap recap that scored poor on the UBO results. So if he sees really strong uncap recap behavior, he is pretty confident that it's going to score high on Harbo. That may not indicate that it's going to score high on UBO. So is it testing for two different things? Is it two different mechanisms? Is it three different mechanisms? Who knows? I will say that the UBO has... Um, I don't want to overstate this, so I don't know exactly how to put it. I don't want to sound like I've drank the Kool-Aid or anything like that, but it's got huge potential. It really does, because they were testing 30 colonies in three or four hours, and some of that's sitting around waiting on the, the frames to age out. So you start the test, you pull a frame, you spray it on, you know, do your recording, take your pictures so you've got your data right. You go put it back in the hive, you grab another frame, and the, the vials of spray are set up in uh, denominations, I think, of 10 or 20 right now. She'll probably do some smaller sizes so that you can test five hives or whatever, you know, smaller dose. But, um, so they would pull 20 frames and then we had a break while we waited on that first hive that was pulled and tested to get to two hours. And then you're pulling that frame as it gets to two hours and, you know, uh, taking pictures and recording the result. And then you go put it back and get the next one and, and record it and get the next one. So it's not like hard work for you know, two or four hours or whatever. It's um, it's a good workflow. It really is. And with two or three people, you could test a lot of colonies in a day. I think the key to it is going to be getting the cost down so that it's not prohibitive. And that is all about scale. You might see that the median there has been recently mowed within the last day I passed the mowing crew a few miles back makes me fuming mad every time I pass a mowing crew in the summer they are burning literally burning taxpayer dollars in fuel and rubber and depreciation and maintenance on those tractors in order to kill pollinator food Talk about a double loser. Burning 
taxpayer dollars to kill pollinator habitat. That makes me so mad. Dogs. It was good, buddy. How are you doing? Ooh, you're good dog too. Ooh, don't put that on his neck. Why? He won't like that. So depending on moisture content, I figure sugar syrup's about 10 pounds a gallon, maybe 11, maybe a little less depending on concentration. So I'm feeding out of a. 55 gallon drum that I'm carrying around in the bed of my truck. This thing weighs 500 pounds and my truck's really sprung for stock weight. So it's been sagging pretty noticeably in the rear. So I got a set of heavy duty leaf springs and I'm having a local shop put those on today. Well, there's my grass. And uh, I woke up last night and a thought went through my head. Boy, I hope a virgin hadn't gotten in there and killed them all. <laughs> We're about to find out, I guess. It's weird how random negative thoughts like that will go through your mind sometimes. Well, that's a relief. They look good. Look really good. Well, that'll be one more miss. So four misses. That wasn't a miss though, that got started, but the bees knew that something was wrong with it, so they chewed it down. So that's actually a good thing. They uh, they graded that out for me. That's a problem I didn't have to find. Didn't have to waste a nuke on it. So I really like this little queen wheel. I keep this in the console of my truck. It's aluminum. It's made by DC's Gadgets. I think he's got a website. And you can see I grafted on the 29th. It was a month with 31 days, so I don't have to adjust. I had cap cells on the 3rd. They need to be in the incubator on the 6th. I need to get them in a nuke on the 8th. They emerge on the 9th or 10th. And I should have laying queens in there by the 19th. I like this. I paid full price for it. And if I lose it, I'm going to buy another one. It's small. Most of the other queen wheels are paper, laminated paper, and uh, they're big. This one rides around with queen marking pens and stuff in my console. I've got at least a half a tank of sugar syrup, uh, maybe three quarters, in the bed of my truck right now, plus a load of concrete block. I'm going to set out some more hive stands and feed. And these new springs make a more difference than I expected. Uh, not sagging, I'm not hitting bump stops or the, the flat bar on the bottom of the spring pack. It actually rides a lot better. I get a lot less lean. Pretty happy with that. Uh, super strong, super strong hive. That's a queen from this spring. I requeen them with a nuke. And they've got two very full supers and one that's almost full. This one, they're working on the eighth and 10th frames in that box. So I put the box they're working on down here. Tastes like it might have a little touch of sour wood in it. Um, it's, a, it's a good honey. Whatever they're working is really good. I put a box of foundation on top of that. And then I'll put an escape board on top of this. I'm gonna harvest those two supers of honey. I'll come back in a couple days and pick them up and that will start my honey harvest for this year. Just leaving one of my new bee yards that I set up this spring. And this is a high, dry, rocky ridge, hills and hollows type area. 
and there is a ton of sourwood trees that are setting flower and getting ready to bloom i actually look through the woods with binoculars and there it's just everywhere and uh boy that's exciting i'm trying to temper my hopes though because i know that i'm out of the elevation range for good sourwood nectar production uh, it likes to produce really good between 1800 and 2200 feet elevation i'm at 700 feet elevation so i'm probably not going to get anything from it but uh it's my first season in this bee yard and there's all this potential and unknown and hope and uh, optimism i guess so i guess i'm hoping for the best and trying to expect the worst <laughs> This was not an intentional test here, but I've got five Pirco frames and then five Man Lake frames and foundations. And they're jumping on that Pirco and drawing it out. They, they're working on at least four of them. And they're working on one or maybe two of the Man Lakes. I think these man lakes were stored over winter though, so maybe the wax dried out or something. I really like those Pirco frames. I really do. Bee space seems good on them. The bees like them. They draw them out nice and straight. Seem to work pretty good, pretty well. I gotta turn the temperature down on my incubator. My queens are emerging a little, well, they're emerging a day earlier than I thought they would. They look good though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about your first queen bee? Now oh, she's, she's all right. She looks good. She's a cheerful thing. So this is a nuke that I made this spring. I confined them to two mediums, gave them a box of drawn comb, and then on 6-1, mm -hmm. I added this box. I pulled one bait frame up and they have almost completely drawn that out in a week or it's what is today the eighth eighth or ninth so in seven or eight days they've almost completely drawn that box out and filled it so i just put another one on well i got excited when i saw how much work this uh this double medium up here with an excluder is doing nobody else is doing anything and I know from my inspections what they're doing. Uh, the brood nest is getting pushed back down. So they're backfilling brood nest rather than uh, drawing new foundations. The queen is slowing down. She knows that, um, you know, we're past the main flow. We're gonna hit the dearth and queen's slowing down. Bees are recapturing that space that she was using early in the spring and they're filling it up. So that third is gonna be full of honey and uh, they're just not in the top drawing anything. That being the case, makes me wonder how can I do more of these, these double mediums? I'm kind of experimenting with that this year, but how do I make that a management practice? Because, you know, I've got hives that have four supers on top of them. Uh, several that have six, uh, have three you know they're into six boxes i have a few into seven a lot of them are into five but this hive up here is a better use of woodenware it's more efficient i've got two brood boxes and three supers on it and, and they may draw out all three of them and fill them so that's something to think about and plan for
All right, so this hive right here, yeah, that one, it swarmed or requeened or something. Population doesn't look that great in there. And I'm making like 30, 30 or 40 splits today and uh, need to replenish some mating nukes. So I've picked a mean hive already. And since this one is weak, they may have a queen in there that's just getting going. Um, I did see some eggs that had multiple eggs in cells that could be laying worker. Regardless, I don't know, they're not performing. So I'm gonna, I've got an escape board under those three supers. It's not time to pull those yet. So I'm gonna strip those supers off, put the escape on a nuke and stack those supers on top of the nuke. And then I'm gonna pull this hive and go bust it up into pieces. And I'll just take, it's 30 frames in there. I'll take one frame out and stick it in 30 different hives. And uh, that way mixing and matching like that, I think um, if there are laying workers in there that should help get that corrected, mixing those with some other bees from other hives and stuff. I think that's a, I think this is a good plan for hives that try to requeen, like production colonies that try to requeen during the flow. You always have some that turn up queenless after you pull honey off of them and they go laying worker. If you can identify those early enough um, and use them in mating nukes or use them to make nukes with, I think this is probably the highest and best use for that hive right now. So it's kind of chaotic here in the mating yard this morning. I've got stuff going everywhere. So what I'm doing is, uh, this is my main hive, that's the super. So I've got food in here, I've got brood in here. I get stung every time I open it. I'm glad that they're gonna get split up. Here's a hive that uh, may be queen right, but maybe not. There's another one that may be queen right, maybe not. These were both production colonies that got weak when I was um, shaking down supers. So I'm gonna use their resources. And what I'm doing is taking these divided medium mating nukes. Let's see if I can do this without smoke. So some of these are a lot stronger than others. See, this one's only about two frames strong. So I'll probably take both of those frames and stick it into a nuke and move it and then replace bees and um, at least a brood frame and a food frame into these and drop a queen cell. Some of these over here I know are pretty strong. Let's see if I can show you another one. Yeah, this one boiling over with bees. So you can see this double nuke. I started that as two frames and they have built out all five. A lot of brood, a lot of bees. So I'll take three out of this, three frames and the queen out of this one, leave two and that's my mating nuke. So I'm effectively splitting it. I've got eight more nukes to set out and feed, and then I can go have lunch. It's one o'clock right now, so I'm gonna get to eat by two. And then I'm done for the day. I am, I am too hot right now. It's 86 outside. I'm too hot. I've drank a gallon of water. I'm almost out. I don't think I'm gonna do, do this again. I like those divided medium mating nukes if you are using them as mating nukes. If you are making nukes, then I think I prefer, I think I prefer just making a nuke, sticking it in the nuke box, and then moving the whole box, not having to shift stuff between, between boxes. But I'm doing this from necessity because I don't have enough equipment available for all the bees and all the honey. So I'm just making do with what I've got. The next year will be a little different. If I can just get through my infrastructure, 
get my infrastructure in place over winter and not find out in January that I'm losing my job and I have to scale three times what I thought I was going to. I can just know about it ahead of time. I think it'll make things a lot easier next year. week um, I got my latest round of splits made 30 30 to 35 I don't know something like that I don't know what that's gonna put me at probably somewhere around 150 160 or 70 140 it's gonna put me about 140 I think so uh, I've got escapes on hives I'm pulling honey supers this morning that will hopefully free up some comb that I can get back on colonies, especially in sourwood and sumac yards. I'm passing a, a clear cut that's maybe, that might be seven or eight years old. And there is a ton of shining sumac and sourwood. There's a sourwood tree in bloom or coming into bloom. It takes sourwood a while after you see the fingers appear to start producing nectar but there's a ton of sumac in here. There's some smooth sumac that is in bloom now. That may be what my bees are working, but there's a huge amount of shining sumac in here. And I was reading Honey Plants in North America about that. I think it's uh, Rus capilina is the Latin for it. It's supposed to bloom in July and August. So a little later in the summer and it, it's supposed to do good if it's hot and dry. So I could get some honey off of that later than I would expect in some yards. I've got another yard that's similar to this. It's on a high dry rocky ridge near a bunch of clear cuts. So um, I'm gonna try to get ready for that. Coming up, of course, I've got honey extraction. I've got to get some more hives shook down. I've got to get escapes on my other three yards and get that honey pulled in. Um, I've got to have a wooden wear day or two or three. I am basically out of equipment to give these nukes that are growing and that cannot happen. Uh, I've got to have frames and foundation See, there's smooth sumac right there that's in bloom. Hopefully you can see that. That's good to see. So I've got to have a, a couple of days at least of building boxes and then I've got to have a wax dip day in the next week or two. And next Saturday, I'm gonna be speaking at the TBA regional conference in Lewisburg. Tennessee so I've got to practice that I do have my presentation pretty well put together and I thought I was speaking for 45 minutes but it turns out it, on the schedule it's 35 so I may actually have to cut some things out which um, it's a whole lot easier to cut a presentation down than it is to stretch one so that's good I want to leave time for questions and interaction and stuff it's gonna be another couple of busy weeks. On the QA this week, I've got a question for you guys. On bucket feeders, how do you keep mold out of them? And second part, once you do have mold in them, how do you get it out? What's the easiest way to clean those things? Um, you don't wanna take the lids off very much 
because the seals will start to leak and then you have to replace the lids. So how do you keep those things clean? I'm having a little issue with that on my mating nukes and I think the answer may be that I shouldn't be using a gallon bucket on a mating nuke. I should use a quart jar or even a pint jar, something like that, or a Gatorade bottle and, uh, and not use a, a big feeder because they can't take it down fast enough and get it dried out. That may be why I'm getting mold. So, you guys have got any wisdom on that, let me know. So in channel news, uh, of course I went to Corey Stevens this week and I've not worked on that footage at all. I've got a lot going on, so I'm gonna try to start the edit on that in the next week. Uh, I promised him that I would do a video for his channel. That'll probably be a longer form one. And then I'll do a, a synopsis type video for my channel. And uh, hopefully they turn out good. I, I got some really good content. Learned a lot and have a lot of unanswered questions. It was really neat to be a part of that. I'm glad I went. Even though it made a long week a lot longer. <laughs> Guys, if you've got any questions, just leave them in the comments below. I appreciate you watching. I'll see you on the next one.